Professor T.K. Uman is a sociologist, author, educationist, and Professor Emeritus at the Center for the Study of Social Systems, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Uman is a recipient of India's highest civilian honor, the Padma Bhushan. That you need to know only three areas of knowledge in the world. One is mathematics. The second is logic. And the third is Sanskrit. He was a Sanskritist himself. What I'm trying to tell you is, while it is not true that Sanskrit can really be identified with a religion, here, Aryan Hinduism, Sanskrit was certainly uh, available and spread across a small thin of <coughs> population all over the country. But, and then of course Persia. When the colonial regimes were uh, implanted in India, they had brought their own languages. English by Britain, French by France, and Portuguese by Portugal in their specific enclaves. And with the subsequent takeover of Britain, a dual system came into work. Education imparted in the 550, roughly, princely states was through their respective local language or mother tongues. But a chain of schools in which inst <coughs> instruction imparted through English also surfaced. See, I, as a young boy, grew up in the state of Travancore in Kerala. And I studied through Malayalam language, of course. Kerala had the great advantage of having single language. And therefore, whether you are from the Travancore or from Cochin or from Malabar, you study through the same language, that is uh, Malayalam. But with the English, the dual system which they have introduced substantially undermined the importance of mother tongues in Indian education system. Now, again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you should not study Sanskrit or English or French, you can. I'm only talking about what should be the initial medium of instruction of the child. Maybe up to fifth class, maybe up to eighth class to which I'll come. <clears throat> the attributed superiority of English medium schools and the stigmatization of schools which imparted education through the vernaculars, the pejorative term the British used to refer to Indian languages, became a persisting curse of Indian education system. As I said, I have studied through the Malayalam medium up to class 10. The English medium schools posed three problems. Again, well known. Availability, accessibility, and affordability. English medium schools in India were and are far too few viewed in terms of the number of children to be educated. By and large, they are inaccessible to the people inhabiting in India's vast rural hinterland. These schools are situated in urban India and in hill stations, charge very high fees, and hence unaffordable to the vast majority of Indians. William Digby, the colonial administrator, wrote in 1901, and this is a small quotation, there are two Indias, the India of the presidency and the chief provincial cities, of the railway systems, of the hill stations. There are two countries, Anglostan, the land especially ruled by the English, in which English invest investments have been made, and Hindustan, practically all of India, 50 miles from each side of the railway lines. This was written in 1901. It would sound somewhat familiar even today, isn't it? English medium schools accentuated the divide between Bharat and India, which is a common term these days. Small wonder, Jawaharlal Nehru in his autobiography observed that mass education cannot be tackled in India through English. He understood it, but I don't know whether much could be done about it by him. And the Indian constitution mandates that compulsory universal education should be provided to all children till the age of 14 through their mother tongues. And the, the last three words are usually ignored. 
Of course, the Constitution says that every child should be educated compulsorily till the age of 14. But through their mother tongues is the most critical thing. And had that happened, our situation would have been much different. The, this robust policy of, is observed in India more in breach, like several other policies. And the fundamental flaw here lies in following the model of nation building, quote unquote, followed by West European nation states. Nations and states existed since antiquity, but they came to be linked only in 1648 with the conclusion of the Treaty of Westphalia, which endorsed Napoleon's dictum for each nation its own state. It came from Napoleon. This was a devastating error, which resulted in what may be called, which I already referred to, cultural side. Let me illustrate it with a few examples. When the Republic of France was constituted in 1789, so I was telling, when the Republic of France was constituted in 1789, there were several nations, that is, linguistic groups in its territory, other than the French, such as Alsatians, Bas, Britons, Catalans, Corsicans, Flemings, and Occitanians. Now I would like to ask you, for just for fun, how many of us have heard these nations? They're all dead. The great land of revolution called France systematically killed all these languages, and everybody was uh, Frenchified. So none of these languages exist today. They lost their, the people of these nations lost their mother tongues. Similarly, the Lombardians, the Venetians, the Sardinians, the Sicilians have lost their mother tongue when Italian language was made the official language in 1861. Incidentally, and it's not in my text, when Italy was constituted, only 3% of the people really knew high Italian. So much so, I forget the name, and even if I remember the name, I cannot pronounce it properly. The Italian novelist said, we have now Italy, we have to create Italians now. And in the case of France, 18% of the people only spoke high French. Others did not know. But they have been all made to speak French or French. In the United Kingdom, which is not so united even today, Scottish, Irish, and Welsh languages were subordinated to English. Again, I can talk at length about it. It's not necessary, we all know. Similarly, multinational Spain had marginalized several mother tongues in its mission of creating nation state. Nations, as I said, always existed. So did states. But the linkage created the problem. And the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 was the beginning. The point to be underlined here is that the institution of nation state has been the graveyard of mother tongues. And uh, I mean, many people don't accept it because we think that a nation state is something like a sacred cow. We should not touch it. It is necessary to identify the specificities of language as a social phenomenon at this juncture, so that the rationale of nurturing several languages in a polity can be understood. I'm trying to argue that if a political formation is a multilingual entity, all the languages within that should be nurtured. And why and how? And that points to the specificity of language. What are these? One, there is no feature of society which is as crucial as language. Even religion is not because one can be an atheist, an agnostic, or a rationalist, and abjure religion. That is, there are alternatives to religion, but nobody can live in a society without a language. There is no alternative to language. I'm not talking about a particular language, but language as a phenomenon. Two, 
While alternatives exist for religion, they are mutually exclusive, even repulsive. Nobody can be an atheist and a believer at the same time. Similarly, a believing Hindu cannot be a believing Muslim, etc. In contrast, one can learn and nurture several languages without diminishing the importance of one's language, that is the mother tongue. What I'm suggesting is that linguistic chauvinism can be moderated substantially, if not avoided completely. If so, why is it that linguistic chauvinism surfaces? <laughs> Language presupposes a collectivity, a group. Finally, even the least developed language is adequate for conducting the basic functions of life, such as economic transactions in the local markets, religious worship, local communication, making love, and instructions for elementary education. There is very interesting research on each one of these. Researchers show that when two persons are in intense love, they would like to speak if they share the same language in that language. It's not the foreign language that you have learned. Now, how about those languages without a script if they too are to be used as a medium of instruction? I say this because in India there is a lot of controversy. At one time, I remember one of the great uh, blocks for the, uh, the blockades for the uh, spread of Hindi was uh, the Devanagari script. And it was proposed that let us use the Roman script. There was great objection. Please note that the number of scripts is far too few as compared with the over 6,000 languages in the world. And several languages, very developed languages, are sharing the same script, Roman script, for example. The real issue to be tackled in a polyglot country like India is to identify the number and specify the features of mother tongue which should be used for school education. Let me illustrate the problem with the help of the census of India. In 1931 census of India, the last census conducted by British identified 2,000 mother tongues. That was for undivided India, including Pakistan and Bangladesh now. The count of mother tongue in independent India varied and wavered. In 1951, there were 782. 20 years later, in 71, 1,090. In 1991, 1,576. So in 1991, there were 1,576 mother tongues. Immediately, one can ask, oh, are you saying that all these mother tongues should be used for as medium of instruction, even if it is in the first of five class classes? No. There is more to it. This increase is astounding. And there are two sources of this mind-boggling multiplication of mother tongues. One, the procedure followed. The census enumerator simply lists what is claimed to be mother tongues by those who answer the question, what is your mother tongue? The mother tongues listed include Dravidian, Madrasi, Reddy Bhasha, Muslim Bhadi, Ahiri Hindi, Rajputi, Adharmi, Islami, Christian, and the like. These are mother tongues in our census data. That is, for many people, mother tongue simply connotes their cultural identity. While mother tongue is a source of identity, as I already noted, there are also other sources of cultural identity. That is, a wide variety of cultural identities are simply taken to be mother tongues. This inflates the number of mother tongues. So it is not that we have as many mother tongues as the census of India tells us. <clears throat> On the other hand, in quite a few cases, and this is more amusing, the number of persons who claim a particular identity as their mother tongue is suspiciously low. In 1951, this, that being the first census of independent India, I made a 
analysis of that, in 1951, 73 mother tongues had only one speaker each. I only said a moment ago that no language can exist with one speaker. But the <coughs> Indian census data defies my understanding. They say 73 mother tongues had only one speaker each. 173 mother tongues had 2 to 10 speakers. Is, are they viable? Can we really accept them as data? Out of the 782 mother tongues recorded in 1951, only 132 of them had 10,000 or more speakers. So actually, if you go by the 1951 data, we have something like 132 mother tongues spoken in this country. It may be 150. And we are one-sixth of humanity, please remember. And 150 is not a big number for that mass of humanity. So when I further looked at it, in 1991, only 216 mother tongues out of 1,576 listed had 10,000 or more speakers. I mean, 10,000 is not a magic number, but I'm just, I thought that 10,000 is a reasonably good number to concede an administrative, local administrative unit, I call it panchayat. So even the study, I mean, the, you can uh, poof poof the uh, census data, but look at uh, the, the um, uh, data produced by the Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore. In 1973, they counted 1,598 mother tongues. Of these, only 263 had 10,000 or more speakers. The methodology is the same. Because you, if you ask somebody, what is your mother tongue, he or she says something. And that is recorded. Because there is a great idea of freedom of expression, you see. <laughs> you can say any nonsense, and then that should be recorded. No. There should be a method by which we must arrive at a procedure that how do you really identify mother tongues? Therefore, the first necessary step to be taken to ascertain the number of mother tongues in India is to have a reliable listing of mother tongues. We don't have it even today. Because if we are to meaningfully pursue the constitutional mandate of providing compulsory universal education through the mother tongue of the child, we must have a clear picture of the phenomenon referred to as mother tongue. We don't have it. I believe that the National University of Educational Planning and Administration has a key role to play in this context, because school education falls within your purview. Of course, you, you operate from the lowest to the highest. But school education is not exempt from your purview. So if you really want to sort out the issues of school education, it's a fundamental thing to understand what should be the language through which school education will have to be imparted. The issue of arriving at a clear understanding of mother tongue is only the first step. Nupa should clearly opt for one of the two possible perspectives. Now, this is for you to choose, but I am only uh, trying to indicate the possible lines. Either following the model followed by West European nation states, namely cultural monism, or that means single language, or celebrate cultural pluralism in tune with India's social reality and accommodative genius. The position of the Official Language Commission took in uh, its reports submitted in 1956 should be, in my view, the guiding principle. It observed, and I quote, the variety of Indian linguistic media is not a national skeleton to be ashamed of and to be somehow hidden away, which is what we are doing now. It is a wealth of inheritance in keeping with the continental size ancient history and tradition of assimilating and harmonizing diverse cultural and racial elements of which this country can be justly proud. And this report was uh, 
submitted in the year 1956, incidentally, the same year in which the SRC, the State Reorganization Commission, submitted its report. Now, the constitution of the uh, State Reorganization Commission was certainly a bold step. So, the State Reorganization Commission, I believe, was one of the finest things that have happened in independent India. We have, uh, uh, at that point in time, uh, done our job. But since uh, 1956, 20 provincial states, union territories, or autonomous regions have been created. And a dozen demands are pending. But there is a basic contradiction between the constitutional position and the SRC report on the one hand, and the official language commission on the other. Now, why I say there is a basic contradiction between the, the Indian constitution and the SRC report on the one hand, and the official language commission on the other. Article 351 of the Indian constitution prescribes, and I cannot but read it out <clears throat> you, it shall be the duty of the union to promote the spread of the Hindi language, to develop it so that it may serve as a medium of expression for all elements of the composite culture of India, and to secure its enrichment by assimilating without interfering with its genius, the forms, style, and expression used in Hindustani and in other languages of India specified in the eighth schedule and by drawing wherever necessary or desirable for its vocabulary primarily on Sanskrit and secondarily on other languages. This is Article 351. First of all, Hindustani is not listed in the eighth schedule of the Constitution. Hindi is listed. The Constitution of India conceives Indian polity as a union of states that I hope any one of you have seen and read it. That's the first sentence. It's a union of states. But Article 351 and the SRC created a hierarchy of Indian languages. At the apex of this hierarchy is Hindi, which is designated as a link, official, and national language based on the argument that it is numerically the most important language. Yes, but. Only less than 40% speakers of Hindi is drawn. I mean, people of India are Hindi speakers. And you know what we call Hindi? Is constituted by 50 mother tongues, 50, of which 18 have 1 million or more, and 4 have 10 million or more speakers. Bhojpuri, Chhattisgadi, Magadi, and Rajasthani. They have 10 million or more speakers. The second layer in the hierarchy of Indian languages is constituted by the so-called regional languages, those speech communities having their own states. The regional language complain that they are subjected to Hindi imperialism, forgetting that they invariably establish their hegemony over the mother tongues spoken in the territory of their respective provincial states by subaltern communities. But the subaltern communities of the Hindi region are the worst affected in the context of designating Hindi as the national language. <laughs> a few years ago, I came across a press report regarding massive failure of school children in Hindi, not in Kerala, in Uttar Pradesh. <laughs> On inquiry, I discovered that it happened in the case of children of those districts in which the mother tongues of the pupils were Avadi, Magadi, or Bhojpuri. I hope the message is clear. If you do not impart school education in the mother tongue of the child, the dream of achieving universal literacy will elude us. It may also be noted in passing here that those states which have achieved universal literacy, such as Kerala, are linguistically homogeneous. Not because and people claim so many things, whether it is uh, the, 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 the leftists or the Congress party. 94% of the people who inhabit Kerala have the same language called Malayalam. Whereas, if you look at the statistics, many states have 
so many mother tongues. In order to facilitate mother tongue as a medium of instruction, it is often necessary to keep those who share the same mother tongue in the same political administrative units. But we do not follow this practice. For example, the Bhojpuri speaking people are divided between Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. Much worse is the situation with regard to Adivasis. The Bills, whose language is Bilodi, are vivisected between Gujarat, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. And the Bill children study through Gujarati medium in Gujarat, Marathi medium in Maharashtra, and their medium of instruction is Hindi in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. Now, what is this? Is it my fault that I was born as a Billy? Why should I study in a language at the initial stage other than my mother tongue? So, a legitimate question which can be posed at this juncture is, can mother tongue be the sole medium of instruction? The answer is certainly not in the affirmative. Gradually, a second language in addition to mother tongue needs to be introduced, which would vary from region to region. Still later, competence in a third language, be it Hindi, English, or something else, to impart knowledge in theoretical physics or econometrics, none of the Indian languages would be functional. But that does not mean that we should ignore mother tongues in those contexts where they are functional. As I suggested at the very outset, appropriate languages should be adopted and nurtured for instrumental purposes without sacrificing the symbolic and instrumental importance of mother tongue. By noting that my advocacy of mother tongue as the medium of instruction in schools is a pragmatic ideal for reasons. First, Clear and adequate communication at the grassroots level is possible through local languages that are usually mother tongues. Second, administrative units to be effective and viable ought to be coterminous with communication units, that is, areas in which mother tongue is used for communication. Third, languages are generally speaking linked to specific territories and territorially anchored religious communities have a shared culture and lifestyle. Fourth, most mother tongues, irrespective of their level of development, are capable of effective communication in the context of everyday life. Finally, the concept of neighborhood school and the child's mother tongue as the medium of instruction works in tandem, and such an arrangement is bound to foster social transformation through education. Thank you so much. You are very patient.